I'd like to ask you a question essentially about the methodology in studying the propaganda model and how would one go about doing that? Well, there are a number of ways to proceed. Uh, uh, one obvious way is to try to find more or less paired examples. Uh, history doesn't offer true controlled experiments, but it often comes pretty close. Uh, so one can find uh, uh, atrocities or abuses of one sort that on the one hand are committed by official enemies and on the other hand are committed by uh, friends and allies or by the favored state itself, by the United States in the U.S. case. And the question is whether the media accept the government framework or whether they use the same agenda, the same set of questions, the same criteria for uh, dealing with the two cases as any honest outside observer would do. If you think America's involvement in the war in Southeast Asia is over, think again. The Khmer Rouge are the most genocidal people on the face of the earth. Peter Jennings reporting from the killing fields, Thursday. I mean, the great act of genocide in the modern period is Pol Pot, 1975 to, through 1978. That atrocity, I think it would be hard to find any example of a comparable outrage and outpouring of fury and so on and so forth. So that's one atrocity. Well, it just happens that in that case, history did set up a controlled experiment. Have you ever heard of a place called East Timor? Uh, I can't say that I have. Where? <laughs> East Timor? Nope. No, huh? Well, it happens that right at that time there was another atrocity, very similar in character, but differing in one respect. We were responsible for it, not Pol Pot. Hello, I'm Louise Penny, and this is Radio Noon. If you've been listening to the program fairly regularly over the last few months, you'll know East Timor has come into the conversation more than once, particularly when we were talking about foreign aid and also the war and a new world order. People wondered why, if the UN was serious about a new world order, no one was doing anything to help East Timor. The area was invaded by Indonesia in 1975. There are reports of atrocities against the Timorese people. And yet Canada and other nations have consistently voted against UN resolutions to end the occupation. East Timor was a Portuguese colony. Indonesia had no claim to it and in fact stated that they had no claim to it. During the period of colonization, uh, there was a good deal of politicization that different groups developed. A civil war broke out in August 75. It uh, ended up in a victory for Fredlin, uh, which was one of the groupings, described as populist Catholic in character with some typical leftish rhetoric. Indonesia at once started intervening. Ford and Kissinger visited Jakarta, I think it was December 5th. We know that they had requested that Indonesia delay the invasion until after they left because it would be too embarrassing. And within hours, I think, after they left, the invasion took place on December 7th. This council must consider Indonesia's aggression against Timor as the main issue of the discussion. When the Indonesians invaded, the UN reacted as it always does, calling for um, sanctions and condemnation and so on. Various watered-down resolutions were passed, but the U.S. was very clearly not going to allow anything to work. By 1978, it was approaching really genocidal levels. The church and other sources estimated about 200,000 people killed. Uh, the U.S. backed it all the way. The U.S. provided 90% of the arms. Uh, right after the invasion, arms shipments were stepped up. When the uh, Indonesians actually began to run out of arms in 1978, the Carter administration moved in and increased arms sales. And other Western countries did the same. Canada, England, Holland, and everybody who could make a buck was in there trying to make sure they could kill more Timorese. There is no Western concern for issues of aggression, atrocities, human rights abuses, and so on, if there's a profit to be made from them. Uh, nothing could show more, it more clearly than this case. It wasn't that nobody had ever heard of East Timor. Crucial to remember that there was plenty of coverage in the New York Times and elsewhere before the invasion. The reason was that there was concern at the time over the breakup of the Portuguese Empire and what that would mean. There was a fear that it would lead to independence or Russian influence or whatever. After the Indonesians invaded, the coverage dropped. Uh, there was some, but it was strictly from the point of view of the State Department and Indonesian generals. Never a Timorese refugee. 
as the atrocities reached their maximum peak in 1978, when it really was becoming genocidal, coverage dropped to zero in the United States and Canada, the two countries have looked at closely, literally dropped to zero. All this was going on at exactly the same time as the great protest of outrage over Cambodia. The uh, level of atrocities was comparable. In relative terms, it was probably considerably higher in Timor. It turns out right in Cambodia in the preceding years, 1970 through 1975, there was also a comparable atrocity for which we were responsible. The major U.S. attack against Cambodia uh, started with the bombings of the early 1970s. They reached a peak in 1973, and they continued up till 1975. They were directed against inner Cambodia. Very little is known about them because the media wanted it to be secret. They knew it was going on, they just didn't want to know what was happening. The CIA estimates about 600,000 killed during that five-year period, which is mostly either U.S. bombing or a U.S.-sponsored war. So that's pretty significant killing. But also, the conditions in which it left Cambodia were such that high U.S. officials predicted that about a million people would die in the aftermath just from hunger and disease because of the wreckage of the country. Pretty good evidence from U.S. government sources and scholarly sources that the intense bombardment was a significant force, maybe a critical force, in building up peasant support for the Khmer Rouge, who before that were a pretty marginal element. Uh, well, that's just the wrong story. After 1975, atrocities continued, and that became the right story, because now they're being carried out by the bad guys. Well, it was bad enough. In fact, current estimates are that, well, you know, they vary. I mean, the CIA claimed 50 to 100,000 people killed and uh, maybe another million or so who died one way or another. Michael Vickery is the one person who's given a really close, detailed analysis. His figure is maybe 750,000 deaths above the normal. Others, like Ben Kiernan, suggest higher figures, but so far without a detailed analysis. Anyway, it was terrible, no doubt about it. Although the atrocities, the real atrocities, were bad enough, they weren't quite good enough for the uh, purposes needed. Within a few weeks after the Khmer Rouge takeover, the New York Times was already accusing them of genocide. At that point, maybe a couple hundred or maybe a few thousand people had been killed. And from then on, it was a drumbeat, a chorus of uh, genocide. The big bestseller on Cambodia, uh, Pol Pot, is called Murder in a Gentle Land. Up until April 17, 1975, it was a gentle land of peaceful, smiling people. And after that, some horrible holocaust took place. Very quickly, a figure of two million killed was hit upon. Uh, in fact, what was claimed was that the Khmer Rouge boast of having murdered two million people. Facts are very dramatic. Uh, in the case of atrocities committed by the official enemy, extraordinary show of outrage exaggeration, no evidence required, faked photographs are fine, anything goes. Also, a vast amount of lying. I mean, an amount of lying that would have made Stalin cringe. It was fraudulent, and we know that it was fraudulent by looking at the response to comparable atrocities for which the United States was responsible. Early 70s Cambodia, Timor are two very closely paired examples. Well, the media response was quite dramatic. Back in 1980, I taught a course at Tufts University. Well, Chomsky came around to this class. And he made a very powerful case uh, that the press underplayed the fact that the Indonesian government annexed this former Portuguese colony in 1975. And that if you compare it, for example, with Cambodia, where there was acreage of things, that this was a communist atrocity, whereas the other was not a communist atrocity.
Well, I got quite interested in this, and I went to talk to the then deputy foreign editor of the Times, and I said, you know, we've had very poor coverage on this, and he said, you're absolutely right. There are a dozen atrocities around the world that we don't cover. This is one for various reasons. So I took it up. I was working as a reporter and writer for a small alternative radio program in upstate New York, and we received audio tapes of interviews with Timorese leaders, and we were quite surprised that given the level of American involvement, that there was not more coverage, indeed practically any coverage, of the large-scale Indonesian killing in the mainstream American media. We formed a small group of people to try to monitor this situation and see what we could do over time to alert public opinion to what was actually happening in East Timor. There were literally about half a dozen people who simply dedicated themselves with great commitment to getting the story to break through. And they reached a couple of people in Congress. Uh, they got to me, for example. I was able to testify at the UN and write some things. Uh, they kept at it, kept at it, kept at it. Uh, whatever is known about the subject is mainly comes from, essentially comes from their work. There's not much else. Chomsky came around. Uh, he had with him a file of all the coverage in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other papers of East Timor. And he would go to the meticulous degree that if, for example, the London Times had a piece on East Timor, and then it appeared in the New York Times, that if a, if a paragraph was cut out, he'd compare and he'd say, look, this key paragraph right near the end, which is really what tells the whole story, was left out of the New York Times version of the London Times thing. There was... Uh, a story in the London Times, which is pretty accurate. The New York Times revised it radically and just leave a paragraph out. They revised it and gave it a totally different cast. It was then picked up by Newsweek, uh, giving it the New York Times cast. It ended up being a whitewash, whereas the original was an atrocity story. So I said to, to, to Chomsky at the time, I said, well, it may be that you're misinterpreting ignorance, haste, deadline pressure, etc., for some kind of determined effort to suppress an element of the story. He said, well, if it happened once or twice or three times, uh, I might agree with you. But if it happens a dozen times, Mr. Meyer, I think there's something else at work. And it's not a matter of happening one time, two times, five times, a hundred times. It happened all the time. I said, Professor Chomsky, having been in this business, it happens a dozen times. Uh, that uh, these are very imperfect institutions. When they did give coverage, it was from the point of view of it was it was a whitewash of the United States. Now you know that's not an error. That's systematic, consistent behavior. In this case, without even any exception. I mean, this is way beyond just demonstrating the subservience of the media to power. I mean, they are actual, they have real complicity in genocide in this case. Now, the reason that the atrocities can go on is because nobody knows about them. Uh, if anyone knew about them, there'd be protests and pressure to stop them.